Um, for those who are following us online, I don't know if it's going to be good morning, afternoon, evening, or I think there's even somebody from Australia, so it might be good night. Um, you know, the program this afternoon, we will now show um, the this evening's event will start with a documentary made by the Knights of Columbus entitled Liberating a Continent, John Paul II and the Fall of Communism. You're all very welcome to the Pontifical Athenaeum Regina Apostolorum, Acton Institute, the two hosts for this afternoon's event. Um, my personal view is that Catholic social doctrine, indeed Catholic commentary on public affairs, uh, is too promiscuous, if I may use the word, in its, in its use of rights language. We describe too many things as rights, and therefore we weaken the notion of rights. But be that as it may, this notion that each one of us has elements of economic creativity built into us as part of our spiritual character uh, is an important one, and that it is one of the roles of the just state to create the circumstances in which each of us can live out and exercise whatever entrepreneurial uh, gifts uh, we have been given, because those gifts are part of our spiritual and moral character. And I suspect Father Sirico, uh, who's thought long and deeply about this, uh, will have some more uh, to say about this uh, a bit later. Then we come in 1991 to the most developed social encyclical of John Paul II, uh, Centesimus Annus. Uh, as the title indicates, this was uh, a centenary reflection on a hundred years of Catholic social doctrine, which begins with Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum in 1891, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, but it's not only a look back, it's a look forward. Uh, and it's the most developed statement of classic Catholic social doctrine uh, that we have, in, in my view, Centesimus Annus. Uh, it does have a very important section on the collapse of communism in 1989 to 1991. Uh, I urge you to have a close look at that because it um, validates the thesis that, that some of us were developing at the time, that while they were surely economic, political, even military factors in the collapse of communism, communism was fundamentally uh, doomed because of its false anthropology because of its false understanding of the human person, and therefore its false understanding of the dynamics of history. Uh, and John Paul II spells that out uh, with, with great insight and uh, reflects on the revolution of conscience throughout Central and Eastern Europe that made possible the uh, political revolution of 1989, uh, a unique feature of 20th century history I might say, because uh, tremendous social change was effected nonviolently, uh, without mass violence. With the exception of Romania, uh, communism collapsed throughout Central and Eastern Europe uh, without shots being fired and without mass slaughter. That's not 20th century's normal way of effecting great social change, and it was a great uh, gift uh, to history and to the future. Uh, and a great lesson for the future. So there is that dimension of Centesium Rosales. But it's the rest of the encyclical that I think it's important to uh, speak about on this, uh, on this centenary, because there are six key themes in Centesium Rosales that, as I said a moment ago, uh, present the highest point of development of the classic Catholic social doctrine tradition uh, and therefore are well worth pondering. The first of those themes is that the free and virtuous society of the future, 
and for John Paul II, freedom and virtue always go together. The free and virtuous society of the future has three interlocking parts. The free and virtuous society is composed of a democratic political community in which there is popular participation in government, a free economy in which the market is the dominant force in economic life, not the state, and in the third place, a robust public moral culture. So three interlocking parts. Three, think of three rings interlocking. A democratic political community, a free economy, a robust public moral culture. And it's the third sector, the public moral culture that is the key to the entire edifice. Free politics and free economics unleash tremendous human energies. Those energies need to be disciplined and directed if they are to result in human flourishing and social solidarity. And it's the task of that vibrant, robust public moral culture to temper and direct the energies of freedom so that freedom leads to nobility, not debasement. So a very complicated, complex, richly textured view uh, of the free and virtuous society, politically, economically, culturally, and the culture is the key to the rest. That's the first point. The second point is that democracy and the market, the free economy, are not machines that can run by themselves. This is a mistake made by both political theorists and e economists who imagine that if you get, simply get the structures of politics and, and the market organized properly, designed properly, then all you have to do is put the key in the ignition and turn the machinery on and the machinery will run by itself. Uh, indeed, I remember at the time of the American bicentenary, uh, the bicentenary of the American constitution in, in 1983, uh, a book was published on the constitutional convention with the title, A Machine That Could Run By Itself. That's, I think, a false understanding of what the framers of the American Constitution understood themselves to be doing. But it's certainly a false idea, according to John Paul II, of free politics and free economics. Democracy and the market are not machines that can run by themselves. It takes a certain critical mass of people living certain virtues to make the machinery of freedom, political freedom and economic freedom work so that the net result, as I said a moment ago, is the flourishing of the individual human person and social solidarity. Now, the first theme of Chintesa Masanas connects to the second theme right here, because it's that third sector the robust, vibrant public moral culture that forms the habits of the heart and the habits of the mind that create that critical mass of virtuous citizens that make living freedom nobly possible. And it is the primary public task of the church to shape that public moral culture. John Paul II was insistent that the church's public role is primarily that of a culture former. Church is not a political party. Church doesn't align itself with political parties or certainly shouldn't. The church has no specific competence, the Pope writes, in technical questions of political theory and economics. The, the church really can't tell you from its own resources, whether, you know, a Westminster parliamentary system like Great Britain is better or worse than an American constitutional democratic republic with a president and a Congress and a Supreme Court. The church can't tell you from its own 
resources, whether, you know, a 27% tax rate is superior to a 23% tax rate, that's really not the church's competence. The church's competence is in forming the souls that form the culture that shape the politics and the economics so that the net result is human flourishing and social solidarity. That does not mean that the church does not have a public voice. Part of the church's forming of the public moral culture is the church's address to grave moral issues of public policy. We'll get to that in a minute when we talk about the life issues and religious freedom. However, uh, this is a development of the social doctrine of the church. Um, this notion that the church is primarily in the culture forming business. And it's one that it's taken the church throughout the world uh, rather a long time to absorb. The third key point in Centesimus Annus is about the nature of freedom. Uh, this remains a terribly urgent point throughout uh, the world today. John Paul II teaches in Centesimus Annus that freedom must be tethered to truth, must be tied to the truth, and freedom must be ordered to goodness. Freedom must aim at goodness if freedom is not to self-destruct. Another way of putting this is to say that freedom is not mere willfulness. I think many of us have heard the famous Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way. There is a sense in which that song, I Did It My Way, is becoming uh, the understanding of freedom throughout the Western world. And it's a false understanding of freedom. Uh, I have uh, a 22-month-old granddaughter and a 20-month-old grandson and a three-year-old granddaughter, as well as the five-year-old granddaughter and the 13-year-old grandson, but the, the little ones, the 20-month-old, the 22-month-old, and the three-year-old, their idea of freedom is I did it my way, or I'm going to do it my way. That, that is a childish understanding of freedom. It's an infantile understanding of freedom. Rather, John Paul II urges us Freedom lived nobly as individuals means doing the right thing for the right reason as a matter of moral habit. Freedom as doing the right thing, and we can know the right thing by reason, for the right reason with the right intention as a matter of moral habit. And of course, we know from the scholastics uh, and our study of of scholastic philosophy, that habitus uh, is another word for virtue. So freedom is a virtue. Freedom is not simply a mechanism of my doing it my way. Freedom in, in, in our personal lives, in our individual lives, it's our lives as citizens, uh, has to be thought of as a virtue. And there is a public meaning of freedom as well. Uh, freedom is not simply the state creating a neutral playing field uh, in which anyone can do whatever they like as, no one else, as long as no one else gets hurt. Rather, the Pope urges us to think, as he put it in a homily in Baltimore in 1995, that, that freedom in public, freedom as it bears on the organization of political society, means having the right to do what we ought having the right to do what we ought and the state recognizing that as part of this constitutional and positive law. Fourth key point in Centesimus Masanus uh, is that the natural and voluntary associations of what we have come to call civil society. Natural associations like the family, voluntary associations like the church, business corporation, a trade union, uh, a civic association, clubs of various sorts, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These natural and voluntary associations of what we now call civil society are essential parts 
of the free and virtuous society. Any thinking about society today in which there's just the state and the individual is, is mistaken. There is this rich mediating sector of natural and voluntary associations that we call civil society. They are essential to the free and virtuous society. Why? Well, first of all, because they keep the state, the government, from occupying all of the social space. And secondly, John Paul II teaches, because these natural and voluntary associations are what he calls schools of freedom. Where do we learn to be the kind of citizens, the kind of economic actors, the entrepreneurs, the consumers, who live political freedom and economic freedom nobly? We don't learn that in the main from the government. We learn that in the family. We learn that in religious communities. We learn that in voluntary associations of, of various sorts. And therefore, these voluntary associations and natural institutions like the family, which exist between the individual and the state, exercise what John Paul II calls in Centesimus Annus, the subjectivity of society. The subjectivity of society. And at a moment in which throughout the Western world, um, state power is encroaching more and more on the activities of natural and voluntary associations, it is very important for the church to defend not merely the legitimacy of the natural family and voluntary associations of all sorts throughout society, but to emphasize how important they are for living freedom nobly. Now, the last two of these six key points in Chintese Mazanus uh, bear on economic life. Um, and the first has to do with the nature of wealth. Between Rerum Navarum and Chintesimus on this. The social doctrine of the church, oddly, had a kind of materialistic notion of wealth. Wealth was either land or stuff in the ground, natural resources. Um, John Paul II came to understand that while that might have defined the meaning of wealth at earlier periods of human history, Wealth in the post-industrial world was different. Wealth was not just land or stuff in the ground. Wealth was, is a matter of creativity, of human creativity applied to the material world. The great example of this, I think, in our time is silicon. Silicon is stuff. Silicon is a physical element. It had been around for billions of years. Silicon was not a source of wealth until somebody invented the silicon microchip. And that's why we all have these things. And that's why we can do this on Zoom. And that's why the greatest explosion of wealth in human history has taken place in what we call the IT revolution. Wealth is creativity applied to stuff. That's a keen and key insight of John Paul II in Chantasium is Honest. It lifts the social doctrine out of this odd materialism and really lifts it into the, war, into the realm of the spiritual. Because creativity is part of the spiritual life for human beings. So uh, these entrepreneurial instincts that apply imagination to stuff, to material, so that it becomes a source of wealth and improves the human condition and lifts people out of poverty, 
These are all spiritual exercises of a particular sort. And that brings us to the sixth key point of Chintesa Vasanas, and that has to do with the nature of poverty. If, if poverty, if, sorry, if, if wealth is just stuff, and there is a fixed amount of stuff, of material goods in the world, then the crucial moral question is the just distribution of that fixed amount of stuff. However, if there is more to the material world than a fixed amount of stuff, if wealth expands as human creativity is applied to the material world, if wealth grows, then poverty is not simply a matter of not having enough stuff, although that can be very much a part of poverty. Poverty is a matter of exclusion from the places and the networks where wealth is created and distributed. Wealth is exclusion from the process of creating and distributing. Poverty is exclusion from the creation and distribution of wealth. And therefore, anti-poverty programs, the Pope teaches, must be programs of empowerment, programs that empower individuals to become part of those networks of production and exchange where wealth grows and is distributed. And that means that we should think of poor people not as problems to be solved with a handout, but as people with potential who must be empowered. Empowered to participate in the life of the free economy so that they too are part of the expansion and distribution of wealth. So those are the six key themes of Chintesa Masonis. And let me just briefly conclude my remarks here with two notes on two other encyclicals of John Paul II that are not social encyclicals, strictly speaking, but which have important things to say about social life. The first of these is the 1993 encyclical on the renewal of moral theology, Veritatis Splendor. Uh, that's not a social encyclical. However, in it, the Pope raises a very interesting question. He says, the equality of everyone before the law is a fundamental principle of, of the free society, and particularly of democratic society. But what's the ground of equality? How do we assert and defend this notion of human equality in a world in which people are manifestly unequal? Some people are smarter than other people. Some people cook better than other people. Some people are better athletes than other people. Some people are handsome or beautiful. Some people are not so handsome or beautiful. The world is full of inequality. Inequality is what presents itself to us all the time. So what is the ground, what's the basis on which we can assert this democratic equality? And the Pope makes a very interesting suggestion. He says that the fundamental ground of human equality is the equality of every human being before the natural moral law, the moral law we can know by reason. Each one of us is equal in that each one of us is called to avoid intrinsically evil acts, which we can know to be wrong. That's a very interesting way, by the way, to construct a theory of democracy. And perhaps some of you in your future graduate studies will want to take that question up. Finally, uh, in the 1995 encyclical Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life, uh, the Pope makes some very important points about the life issues and their relationship to the free and virtuous society of the future. Uh, he warns 
suggests that societies <laughs> in which what we can know to be wrongs are elevated to the status of rights are in serious trouble. Uh, we know this throughout the Western world now on the question of abortion uh, and on the related uh, question at the other end of the life spectrum, euthanasia. Uh, the Pope warns against uh, what his successor, Benedict XVI, would later call the dictatorship of relativism. The imposition of a relativistic morality, a morality of I did it my way, if you will, on all of society by the use of, of coercive state power. And the Pope insists that a culture of life, a culture in which life is cherished and reverenced from conception until natural death, is essential to democracy. Um, in all of this, I believe that there hung over the mind of John Paul II, the terrible example of Weimar Germany, the German Republic between the First and Second World Wars, uh, a beautifully constructed democratic edifice, which collapsed in 13 years uh, because of an inadequate moral cultural foundation. And part of that inadequate moral cultural foundation was a contempt for certain forms of life. Uh, the notion of life unworthy of life, the life of the severely handicapped, the life of the, of the retarded, eventually the life of people who are not like us because they're Roma or Jews or whatever. Uh, that was born in Weimar, Germany. Uh, and that rotted out the moral cultural foundations of the first German experiment in, in real democracy. And the Pope, who had lived through the results of that in the Nazi occupation of Krakow and, and of Poland, was painfully aware of that. And that's a cautionary tale for all of us. We must tend to the moral cultural foundations of the free society or the institutions of free politics and free economics will be in danger. Thank you for your attention. That's a lot of material in, in just 30, 35 minutes, but I hope it gives you some sense of the framework of the social doctrine of John Paul II and its great relevance to today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George, for this um, embrace of John Paul II's social economic thinking. And it's marvelous to see not only in his, on those themes, uh, what is behind there, but also in other areas of his teaching, that marvelous, consistent Christian personalism. But there's the idea of man, Christian man, that unites all the various different themes that John Paul um, preaches on throughout his entire pontificate. Um, I'd like to turn now to our second speaker, um, Father Robert Sirico. Thank you very much. Vi ringrazio molto per l'invito essere con tutti voi. I'm just sorry I can't be with you personally. Uh, in Rome. Uh, much of what I will say will uh, reinforce or, or focus some of what uh, Mr. Weigel's already brought to the table. Uh, I, I hope that I'll focus a bit more on the economic question as such. Uh, I understand that to be my, my assignment. Of course, the moral test for any social or governmental policy is whether it is consistent with a rigorous concern for the life, liberty, and dignity of the human person, which has been given to us by God, by the nature of our creation itself. And along with that dignity, God gives to each of us the rightful expectation that our liberties be respected and that justice be pursued on our behalf so that we may work for our own personal and familial fulfillment and ultimately uh, achieve uh, the full relationship and the beatific vision by the right use of our liberty. Uh, in 
the various encyclicals of the Holy Father, while, while I will uh, allude to and, and focus on Centesimus Sanos, I think it's important, as, as George has already pointed out, that this is of a piece, that it emerges and, in fact, develops as a result of John Paul's thinking and his own human experience, his thinking in terms of the personalism uh, that was just mentioned, but also his own personal experience, uh, having lived under both the, the two of the the, the major uh, totalitarian regimes of, of our age. In his encyclicals touching on economic systems, we see a remarkable contribution and indeed a development to religious thought, Catholic thought in particular, concerning public policy and free economic systems. So I'm not going to uh, be able in, in you know, the 15, 20 minutes that I have to present the fullness of that, but just a brief overview and perhaps just cite some of the passages uh, in the various encyclicals uh, that will help reinforce this. Um, I think it'd be an error to characterize the thought of John Paul by exclusive reference to economics, even though that is uh, my focus, uh, because it's situated in this broader understanding of the nature of the human person to begin with. And what John Paul II did uh, is to call for a wholly different approach that rises above the materialism of Western capitalism, the bureaucratization of European welfare states, and the mercantilist, uh, mercantilist tendencies of much of Latin American economies. Uh, it's also incorrect in my I notion to associate the Pope's thought with what he calls a third way, which has become popular in some movements uh, today, third way between laissez-faire uh, and state planning. And the Pope himself says that, that the church's social doctrine is not a third way, uh, that it's a whole different way of, of approaching the question. He says this in uh, Solicitudo Rei Socialis and reinforces it in Centes Musanos. And uh, I want to uh, underscore the point that George made about the church having no economic models to present, uh, that they arise from different historical situations and that we have to adapt them being formed by the moral law and the church's teaching. Uh, to our particular concrete circumstances. Yet, nonetheless, it is true that uh, John Paul's major contributions to social thought are inspired by a profound recognition of collectivism, uh, the failures of socialism, which was the key social political doctrine of the 20th century in many respects. Uh, it collapsed with the fall of the Soviet Union, but it, uh, we see a resurgent, uh, or at least efforts to, to bring this to the fore again today. He says the fundamental error of socialism is anthropological in nature. This is a, a, a motif running through uh, his writings on, on these questions, particularly in Chetes Mosano's uh, number 13. Um, I think also uh, there's a wonderful corrective in uh, John Paul's writings with regard to the politically charged word capitalism, which means much too much to too many people. Uh, our friend Rocco Buttiglioni brings this out. Instead, with some reluctance, John Paul embraced the phrases free economy and business economy. Uh, he uses the phrase, the modern business economy has positive aspects uh, because of the basis of freedom exercised in the economic field. Uh, and I think seeing this in, in the, the broader context, uh, not just of economic questions, but of human questions, one dimension of which would be economic. Um, 
there's a robust embrace of these ideas in Centesimus Sanos uh, as the um, more efficient way, certainly the more efficient instrument for utilizing these resources, he says. Um, a juridical setting as well is necessary to pre protect the requisite institutions of property exchange, entrepreneurship, and the rule of law. And secular attempts to disregard these essential institutions or weaken them in one way or another or disregard them, especially during the, the last century, although we see it again uh, today, uh, have resulted in material deprivation, human impoverishment, uh, and uh, great sadness. Um, he comes to the question of exchange, association, and enterprise. Uh, the aim of economic policy should be to expand the productive uh, and uh, uh, dimensions of society and the availability of goods and services in order to increase the quality of life uh, for people. But uh, the, this has to be done in a consistent manner with the rights of human beings and the common good. But these goals are not incongruous. Uh, they, the respect for human liberty and the increase of the quality of life are both features of uh, an exchange economy. In this form of economy, people are left free to improve their lot through cooperative human efforts. Economic theory teaches that the institutions of economic exchange uh, the institution of economic exchange is the primary means by increasing overall material prosperity. When an economic exchange takes place, uh, when a free economic exchange takes place, the uh, benefits are reciprocal. So, uh, and now the introduction of currency or money into this exchange, an important dimension of economy, uh, is not uh, money is not irrelevant to all of this. Uh, money uh, doesn't change the essential cooperative nature of the market. Money merely makes it possible for the parties in an economy to have a common unit of value, further facilitating the opportunities for trade as well as efficiency. In a money economy, the unit of exchange becomes the common measure by which people could communicate with each other and cooperate with each other uh, with regard to their respective talents and needs. So money significance is the most economically desirable commodity precisely because it, of its use as a means of exchange. And then the cooperation or the creation of a network of human cooperation that permits rising prosperity, uh, we have to recognize is impossible to achieve without uh, a money system, without economic exchange. Uh, as much as possible then freedom and what uh, John Paul calls the right to association needs to be permitted so that people can seek out others and their respective talents and knowledge and abilities precisely through this voluntary system of cooperation exchange. Uh, it is why the Pope took special mention uh, of the economic and political institutions in the United States, as George has already pointed out. The market economy and its requisite institutions are not only highly desirable in the market for goods and services, also in the labor sector, where people often offer their talents to others in return for the payment of wages, salaries, free exchange, the free association, all of this is a crucial component of a healthy community as a whole, not just the healthy economy. All people are called to work for their own well-being, as well as the well-being of society as a whole. Uh, St. John Paul says, quote, the church's teaching has always expressed the strong and deep conviction that man's work concerns not only the economy, but personal values, close quote. That's uh, from his encyclical um, Laborum Exertions number 94. Now, this work, of course, can take many forms, 
and its ultimate value is obtained when it's offered for the glory of God, uh, regardless of new, uh, remuneration. In a free economy, however, wages and salaries reflect the contributions an individual worker makes to the community of workers in the business firm and the overall wealth of society. The freedom of employees to, ex to change jobs, the freedom of employers to make uh, enforceable contracts uh, with workers ensures that each person has, can find the opportunity for work. Uh, man, therefore, he says, is the subject of work. Uh, as a person, he works, he performs various actions belonging to the work process, independently of their objective content, these actions must all serve to realize uh, his humanity, to fulfill his calling uh, as a human person. Uh, this, this is what John Paul II sa uh, second says in Liberum Exertions. Again, the market economy for labor works to make sure that workers are paid a wage that corresponds to their talents and contributions. A thriving exchange economy for labor requires more than a commitment to equality. Uh, people are radically different. Uh, no two members of society have identical interests or talents. An economic system would make it possible for everyone who so wishes to participate in the common task of building prosperity. Fortunately, co the cooperative nature of the market economy makes this possible so long as there are no unnecessary barriers to entering existing particular markets for goods and services and withdrawing from them. And yet the labor market can easily be um, uncoordinated through an ill-advised policy uh, of markets for goods and services, which make all wages and salaries the same, for example, uh, labor equality or parity, through inhibiting the free movement of laborers from one firm to another. Uh, employees need to be treated with the dignity and respect that is in accord with their nature as human persons. This obligation should be considered binding because it grows out of uh, our very nature and Christ's command that we love uh, each other. Um, one unfortunate feature of much modern religious thought uh, on economics is the characteristic lack of the appreciation of the entrepreneurial function. In fact, I don't think the word entrepreneur, George can correct me on this, appeared in an encyclical uh, until Centes Mosanos. Uh, the world is not static. That's why we need entrepreneurs. People's needs and values are constantly changing, becoming more informed, developing. And an economic system requires a means of adjustment to that reality. The person who invests him or herself and the resources that they own is choosing to assist the economy to keep up with these changes. And an entrepreneur must constantly be aware of the needs of others sometimes even before others have become conscious of their own needs and how to apply those resources. Um, I consider one of the, the real significant uh, contributions of St. John Paul II uh, to be his having introduced this notion of the right to economic initiative and the vocab the introduction of that phrase into the vocabulary of uh, theologians. The Pope says, it should be noted that in today's world, among other rights, the right of economic initiative has been suppressed. Of course, he saw this so brutally uh, in his own Poland. Um, when entrepreneurs are successful, they advance the cause of a growing prosperity by providing goods and services that people need and want. And then there's the discovery process that's part of entrepreneurship, uh, new ways of undertaking old tasks or utilizing uh, resources. What the entrepreneur does is to rediscover old ways 
uh, or new ways uh, uh, to do things. They find more efficient ways of producing things. And this is another way of saying that they demonstrate to us the ways that God's resources can be put to use more wisely, more prudently. And by providing jobs, moreover, they do this in a way that is respectful of human dignity. Uh, I think one of the key elements of, uh, or, or phrases in Centesimus Anos that really applies to many, many aspects of modern life is when he says that man's principal resource is man himself. This is Centesimo Santos number 32. I mean, think of how uh, that addresses e ecology questions, questions of environment, questions of um, uh, uh, birth policies and the, uh, and the prejudice against uh, children. Uh, the Pope says that it is man's intelligence that enables him to discover Earth's productive potential and the many different ways in which human needs can be satisfied. So it's this that really uh, stands over and against so much of the planned economies and their lack of appreciation for the economic innovator that inhibit this innovation uh, and uh, destroy the chance to uh, uh, create uh, this entrepreneurial function is often associated, we know, with high profits. Yet the market, the only way that, in the market, the only way high profits can come about is when someone is offering products and services uh, at a price that is desirable to uh, other people. So I think that the, what's brought out in uh, Centesimo Sanos is this role of the entrepreneur as the most obvious example of the person who uses creative talents given him by the creator, uh, who, is an, uh, who is the uh, impresario par excellence, uh, and then others in a market-based division of labor should also exercise this virtue of enterprising creativity uh, in whatever ways uh, are possible. Um, the freedom of enterprise, of course, is the best institutional setting for these lessons. Um, and uh, the parable of the talents, of course, bears that out so beautifully. We could go into a discussion of ownership and stewardship, but all of this is derived, of course, uh, from... Uh, what I've already said about uh, the human person and the nature of the human person. I just want to make a note uh, with regard to uh, property as a source of conflict. This is often uh, seen as the, um, uh, you know, needs to be repressed or uh, suppressed. We're reminded constantly that it's not absolute, which of course is true. Um, you know, no, no rights are absolute when you stand against God himself. But the role of property uh, needs to be seen in its use to improve the human condition. Uh, John Paul says that it's obvious when we speak of the opposition between labor and capital, we are not dealing only with abstract con concepts or impersonal forces operating in economic production, but behind both concepts, there are people, living actual people. He returns to this theme of uh, the human person, of anthropology, of personalism, uh, repeatedly. Uh, I'm just gonna skip over in order to respect our, our time on this, but it's important to understand that property in the tradition of the church has been considered sacred uh, because of its close association with the intelligence of the human person, the capacity to discover the use of resources. And in fact, in the, you know, Exodus uh, chapter 20 in the Ten Commandments, the injunction against theft, which presumes, of course, the right to private property. Um, 
I want to make a note of um, the importance of prices uh, in society. Every society has to have a guide for allocating resources because of the unlimited nature of human wants, always outpacing the scarce resources. Even economies uh, where most or all of the property is held in private hands uh, must have a tool for making sure that those resources are used in ways that the community finds most valuable. It's not automatically clear which of the many possibilities of the use of resources are best. So we have to have a way of knowing whether water is better used for drinking, bathing, or irrigation, uh, et cetera. The best way, the wisest way to allocate uh, the network of prices, uh, which arises naturally from buying and selling. That's the way that we can do it. Here, the law of economics comes into play. When the price of a good is lower, it signals abundance. When it's higher, it uh, indicates its scarcity. So uh, we have to respect that reality. The idea of profit is simply the name that accounting and bookkeeping attaches to the conditions of the, uh, the condition of outcome outpacing co costs. When a company is making a profit, uh, it is clear that the company is doing what it set out to do. And here, John Paul probably most emphatically uh, teaches something that I think we need to relearn in our own time. He says, the church acknowledges the legitimate role of profit as an indication that a business is functioning well. When a firm makes a profit, this means that productive factors have been properly employed in corresponding to human needs, uh, which have been duly satisfied. Um, I'm going to skip my uh, part on excess profit, excess profits, uh, and um, also just um, reiterate what what uh, George has already said about uh, the nature of our work with the poor and the deleterious effects of the welfare state. Here too, in Centesimo Sanus, we have probably the most uh, clear criticism of the humane aspects of the welfare state that we see in the social teaching of the church. Um, he speaks about the way in which uh, social assistance state and its various malfunctions uh, tend to disregard that they promote a bureaucratic mentality and speaks beautifully and I think most elaborately here uh, about the principle of subsidiarity, a community of a higher order not interfering in the internal life of a community of a lower order, and that this becomes the uh, paradigm for social service, um, that the state needs to recognize the resource of first resource is the local community and not the state. Uh, and I, I think this is uh, in large part important to us theologically because when state bureaucracies uh, insinuate themselves between us and those who are in need, we ourselves, the church itself, loses a rich source of her own spiritual uh, nourishment. So this, this whole section on the welfare state, on the social assistance state in Centesimo Sanus is uh, really quite, quite dramatic in the development of the church's teaching. Um, I, I suppose that I don't have to underscore the, um, the, the way in which solidarity and subsidiarity go hand in hand. These are not opposing social principles, but reinforcing social principles. The recognize of ourself in the other person, which is what solidarity is, and the way in which we go about uh, meeting those needs uh, is provided for us in the principle of subsidiarity. So um, I come then to the conclusion of my remarks. Uh, serious social and economic issues confronted uh, John Paul during his pontificate 
not the least of which was the demise of socialism. Uh, our discussion today has highlighted the importance of free exchange, free association, enterprise, private property, the price system, voluntary charity, and the limited role of the state. Uh, I do this um, in the belief that the flourishing of these institutions is consistent with a rigorous concern for the life, liberty, and dignity of the human person, and in harmony with the whole of the moral tradition of uh, uh, Catholic social teaching. Uh, and uh, I hope that we can have a renaissance of this level of discussion about the social teaching of the church, which unfortunately in uh, our current um, moment has somewhat been diminished. So uh, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Robert. And again, it's marvelous to see how the love for the person that John Paul II had, not only from his own philosophical reflections, but from his own life, finds its reflection in economic and social thought. And the idea that I know is so dear to the Acton Institute of unleashing the potential of people, and as you correctly point out, this idea of entrepreneurship is derived from in the case of Centesimus Annus, from John Paul II's love, respect, and dignity for the creative capacity of persons. Now, we have about 15 to 20 minutes of questions. After that, we have a very short message from Cardinal Stanislaus Jibic, who, which was recorded a few days ago in Krakow and Polonia um, for all of us here. But we do have some minutes here for questions and um, uh, Michael, would you like to start? Yeah, um, since we have people been waiting online for quite a bit, and let's, let's ask them, uh, we have one question uh, for you, George, and then we have another question for you, Father Robert. Um, let me take the second question, it's a little bit more broad. Um, this is addressed to Father Robert, and it says, how can we today integrate John Paul the second's doctrine, as you've exposed it, with today's insistence by Pope Francis regarding the poor. In what, in what is a different, excuse me, and what is a different view of economics of wealth? Well, I, I think the, the first thing we need to do, and, and probably George will agree with me, we, we have lived through this pontificate and the moments, the key, kind of key moments. And I think um, at least I tend to presume everybody knows this stuff and that, that we've read it. Um, I, I think it's important first and foremost to reread uh, these documents, the ones that George has referred to, certainly Chintes Musanos, uh, to, to come to a full understanding. I don't think we have today a very deep um, elaboration of the church's teaching. I don't think there's any necessary contradiction, certainly on the moral or theological level between uh, Francis and John Paul. But I do think in terms of depth, in terms of experience, uh, we need to retrieve the, the, uh, the magisterium of John Paul II, that is his teaching magisterium, uh, which can apply. I think there's a difference in emphasis and I think in large part, that difference in emphasis between John Paul and, and Francis is their own personal experience. Um, what, what Francis has seen in Argentina, what exists in Latin America, and the mercantilism I referred to in my presentation, uh, is real. And it needs to be precisely critiqued. Um, and I think... Likewise, in the writings of John Paul, his, his own understanding of collectivism can apply even in the mercantilist circumstance. I'll stop there. Okay. So we'll go to Father Eamon has a question for George. Yes. And in fact, it's uh, of something of a historical nature that came up in the documentary we've seen this afternoon. Um, what parallels can we draw and what lessons can we learn 
regarding the Vatican's relations with China, looking at the contrast between us politique of the 60s and 70s and the very different approach of John Paul II. George? Uh, what we learn is that our friends in the Secretary of State of the Holy See have not learned the lessons of the failed Ostpolitik uh, of the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, I dislike being as sharply critical as that, but I really cannot uh, avoid it uh, at this point. Uh, when in Roman universities, not Regina Apostolorum, uh, when in the Pontifical Ecclesiastical Academy, the Ostpolitik of Cardinal Casseroli is uh, taught uh, as an ideal of Catholic, uh, of Holy See diplomacy. Uh, there has simply been a failure to come to grips with the manifest failures of the Ostpolitik in Central and Eastern Europe. And I'm afraid that those um, uh, mistakes are being repeated uh, with reference to China. Uh, what links both of these failures together, I think, is something that actually goes back far into the 20th century. Holy See diplomacy has had a hard time getting its head around the problem of totalitarianism. Totalitarianism is not simply another thuggish form of government with which the church has been familiar <laughs> since uh, the days of Nero. Uh, totalitarianism is an alternative religion. What Xi Jinping wants in China is what Joseph Stalin wanted in the Poland and the rest of Central and Eastern Europe in which young Karol Wojtyla exercised his priestly ministry. He wants to impose an alternative religion. Uh, this is manifestly clear in China with the requirement that churches now proclaim the writings of Xi Jinping as if they were a form of scripture. And until the diplomacy of the Holy See gets clear that totalitarianism is different and that it cannot be approached as one approaches other forms of thuggish government, then I'm afraid these mistakes are going to continue to be made. Let me make one final point on China. The root of my critique over the past decades, uh, really the past decade, although these, what's going on now has been attempted by some in the Holy See Diplomatic Corps before. Uh, the root of my critique is that it is evangelically destructive. The Chinese communist regime is not immortal. It is going to collapse at some point. And indeed the fact that it's tightening the screws on everyone now, uh, is particularly manifest in Hong Kong, is an, is an expression of weakness, not, not of strength. That regime is not immortal. When it fails, China will be the greatest field of Christian mission since the Europeans came to the Western Hemisphere in the 16th century. Uh, the Catholic Church is going to be severely disadvantaged in bringing the new evangelization to China if it is in any way identified with the detested regime that has just collapsed. This is another lesson of the Ostpolitik. The Ostpolitik essentially destroyed the Catholic Church in Hungary which was perceived, at least in its leadership, accurately to be a subsidiary of the Hungarian Communist Party. So we need to learn these lessons, not to settle scores or make academic points, but precisely for the evangelical future. Okay. Um, we have a question from a Nigerian priest, Father Joseph, and uh, we'll ask that to, um, to Father Robert here in the Q&A, and he essentially asks, um, what in your view is the best system of managing property, privately or in common? So this is a broad, very broad question. Maybe you can give a, uh, a specific example today. Well, I, uh, if, if I wanted to kind of homilize on it, you know, the, the way I would say it is just ask yourself this question. Um, 
would you prefer to use a, a toilet that is publicly operated or privately operated? Uh, <laughs> how do you how do you use uh, an automobile if it's a rental car or your private car? And of course, this is I, I'm just giving these kind of uh, images. Uh, derived from St. Thomas Aquinas. I mean, in the Summa, it's very clear. We, we have more knowledge of the thing, more responsibility for a thing, uh, more use for the thing uh, if it's privately owned. Uh, it's not to say that in certain exceptional circumstances, there can't be something that's um, administrated um, for the common good and, and certain public, uh, uh, for certain public needs. But I think the, both historically uh, on a practical level and uh, morally on the personal level because of the closeness of the human person to property, uh, it is preferable, private property is preferable uh, to uh, collectivized property. Uh, this is even the case so often in, um, in monasteries and religious communities. Uh, there have to be ways of accountability uh, built into property that is commonly owned. Uh, I, I assist <laughs> They're laughing here. I <laughs> and a very personal example, Father Robert. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. We've got time for another couple of questions. And this is one for George. And it's again, it reflects back on the documentary we saw, the one made by the Knights of Columbus, in which you also participate, George. And it goes back to the communist regime in Poland. Why did the communist regime allow or tolerate the nomination of Karol Wojtyla as bishop? Did they think that he could use, they could use Wojtyla in favor of their communist agenda? Yeah, they did. Um, <laughs> it's a wonderful old uh, priest in Krakow, whom I got to know 25 years ago, named uh, Andrei Bardetsky, Monsignor Bardetsky. And um, he used to say that the appointment of Wojtyla first as an auxiliary bishop and later as Archbishop of Krakow was a wonderful example of how the Holy Spirit can work by darkening men's minds <laughs> as well as enlightening them. Um, the, the appointment of Wojtyla as Archbishop of Krakow is a fantastic story, the, uh, which I tell and witness to hope. The way these things worked then was that um, the government would receive a potential nomination from Cardinal Wyszynski, and then it would say yes or no. And Wyszynski proposed six or seven accounts differ, six or seven different candidates to become the Archbishop of Krakow. And the communist thug in charge of these matters vetoed each one of them and eventually told a Catholic parliamentarian, I'll keep vetoing them until I get Wojtyla. He's the one I want. <laughs> they thought he was a kind of airheaded intellectual poet whom they could manipulate. And they got that exactly wrong. So Monsignor Bardetsky's uh, recollection that the Holy Spirit can sometimes work by darkening men's minds as well as enlightening them uh, is a very uh, uh, both amusing and, uh, and true one. And within a year of Wojtyla's appointment as Archbishop of Krakow, uh, one of a uh, Polish priest was in prison for some uh, ridiculous uh, ginned up offense the regime had jailed him for. And the jailer came to see him and said, we're furious, Wojtyla has swindled us. <laughs> they, they thought they had their boy and they didn't in any manner of me. Thank you, George. Yes, it doesn't pay to be up against the Holy Spirit. Um, <laughs> George, a final question, and uh, it's to do with your own personal experience of John Paul II. And I don't know if the <laughs> students here know or those following us 
you relate in Witness to Hope, I think, certainly somewhere else, about a dinner you had, I think it was Father, with Father Newhouse, um, with John Paul II, where the idea came that you would write this biography of John Paul II as a way of introducing him to, um, especially to the United States audience. Would you speak for a moment, please, of your personal experience of the person of John Paul II? Uh, thank you, Father. That story is the beginning of a book called Lessons in Hope, My Unexpected Life with John Paul II, uh, which is a much more personal uh, memoir of, of our uh, conversations over, uh, over many uh, years. Uh, and there are a lot of stories in there that simply wouldn't have fit into two volumes of scholarly biography. So those who want to get to know the man, John Paul II, a bit more intimately might, might have a look at uh, that. Um, he was a remarkably natural human being. He was the most intensely curious man I think I've ever met. Uh, to the very end, he wanted to know what's going on, what are the new books, what are the new arguments, uh, what are the films, what are people talking about. And it, I came to understand over time that that was not some psychological tick in him. It was, it was his way of trying to tune in to what the Holy Spirit was doing in the church and in the world. The more he knew of what's going on, uh, what was really going on, as distinguished from what was journalistically going on, the more he knew what was going on, the more he could, the better he could discern what it was that the Holy Spirit was asking of him going forward. So that's a quality of his. And, and finally, since I know our time is getting short, um, I mentioned this in Lessons in Hope. Our last uh, dinner meeting was on December 15th, 2004. Uh, that was a kind of annual habit that we had formed of dinner a week or 10 days before Christmas. And um, as it happened, my father had died two months before that. Uh, Pope had sent a message for the funeral, which was very kind. Uh, but I certainly did not expect him, and he was in pretty tough shape physically himself at that point, to, to remember uh, that my father had died two months before. And yet the first thing he said to me when I uh, walked into the dining room of the papal apartment that evening was, how's your mother doing? I mean, just great pastor's memory and, and concern. Uh, and that has stayed with me uh, as an expression of both his deep humanity uh, and an expression of how he was a priest's priest until the very end of his life. Yeah. Uh, he was a true pastor till, till the very end. Uh, and I think that's of particular relevance to, to the seminarians present today. Most, most definitely, George, uh, first and foremost a priest. And I think he one of the questions he wrote in that interview witness um, crossing the threshold of hope where he, he quotes Augustine by saying, um, I am a bishop for you, but I am a priest with you. And that idea of being always and firstly a priest um, is certainly relevant for, for most of us here. Um, time constrains us. Thank you both, Father Robert. George, for giving us the honor of having been able to join you both to make alive the person and the teaching of Pope John Paul II. It's something that perhaps for our generation, we grew up with him. He was the pontiff of our youth. And, and for those of us who are priests, our first years of the priesthood, for new generations, I think we have the obligation not to let that memory fade and to bring his person and his doctrine. And this was, this was the core idea behind inviting both of you um, to join us, or for us to join you. Thank you both. I know you're both very busy men with a lot of commitments. We really appreciate this time and your wisdom. We'd like to finish this evening with the grace of a short message that was recorded 
for this event a few days ago in Krakow, Poland, by the most faithful servant of John Paul II for almost 40 years, His Eminence Cardinal Stanislaus Dzibic. Well, now it's a three-minute message, and we'd like to play this for everybody. I'll just reiterate that um, he recorded this message for all of us here and for those who follow us online. Si è notato Gesù Cristo. Da Cracovia desiderei salutarvi tutti studenti e professori dell'Istituto Acton e anche dall'Ateneo Pontificio Regina Apostolorum. Siate radunati oggi, questa sera, per commemorare il grande pontificato Papa Giovanni Paolo II, quando ho pensato cosa dirvi, ripeto, parola che Santo Padre ha pronunciato a Tordorigata in occasione del raduno mondiale dei giovani 2000 anni. Ha detto ai giovani siate sentinelle del mattino e anche vorrei ricordarmi parola che ha detto ai giovani all'inizio del suo pontificato siate speranza mia e speranza della Chiesa bisogna organizzare tutto questo perciò vi auguro approfondire la dottrina di Giovanni Paolo II anche vi invito di conoscere meglio la persona persona di Giovanni Paolo II la persona che è eccezionale per, per eh, sua santità, saggezza e apertura. Lui era sempre amico dei giovani. Spero che anche voi sentite vicino questo pastore universale che vi amava e anche che spero oggi c'è ispira e sta con noi. Affido vostro oggi e vostro futuro a questo Papa così vicino ai giovani e al mondo universitario. Vi benedica Dio Onipotente e chiedo questo per voi tramite Giovanni Paolo II. Grande. Buona serata e buon incontro. Vi aspetto una volontà a Cracovia, città molto amata, unita a Giovanni Paolo II. Grazie. Um, we conclude this evening then thanking His Eminence, our two speakers, the Pontifical Athenaeum Regina Apostolorum, and in particular, Mr. Michael Severance of Acton Institute for his stellar work in organizing this event, and our translator, Brother Jose Alberto Rincon. And so invoking the help and intercession of Pope John Paul II, it is from Rome. Good night and God bless.